Welcome to the Lights and Cash Podcast, boys. Today we got a good one. We talk about intangible offers. So if you don't sell directly ROI offers, how do you sell them? Second thing we talked about is email, daily emails, weekly emails, monthly emails. Which ones do you send if you want to make more money? And the third thing we talked about is lead nurturing. Why your best clients are going to be people who found out about you two days ago. Enjoy. All right. Be honest with me, what percentage of the time do you look at yourself versus the person you're talking to when you're on a call? 90% of the time, it's just looking at myself. I mean, sorry, look, <laughs> looking at the person I'm talking to. Really? Temp- yeah, 10% of the time, it's looking at myself just to make sure I don't look stupid. And then 0% of the time, I've, I don't know if you've ever had a Zoom call with someone where it's like, they're like looking into the camera like this. I can't do it. I can't do it. It's too awkward. Do you ever look into the camera? No, I look at myself all the time. I'm really? Uh, yeah, I just have to admit it. I'm sorry. I like I'm looking at myself right now as I talk. I don't know. It just makes me. I just, I just feel smarter when I do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I like. I tried looking at the camera. I was recording some modules the other day, and I have a friend who's really. Uh, it, it's Kiri. This guy named Kiri. He's really big in like edu- like corporate education. So he know he knows like how to how to do like good education. I was trying to do modules, and he says you have to look in the camera, make your loom screen bigger. So I made the loom circle much bigger, and I just started looking in the camera, and it's so awkward. I can't do it. So yeah, I, I can't make a habit. I feel like I'm looking at like the FBI, <laughs> like the CIA. Like I'm looking straight into the government. So okay, I'll try it. I'll try it. Let's see how it goes. Okay, I wanna today. I wanna talk about being willing to call people out. So have you ever been on a call with a client and they tell you their plan and the plan doesn't make sense to you and you just want to tell them, bro, this shit's not going to work. But you don't because you're like a little, I don't know, there's like a little ish. Ugh, like, I don't know. I, it just feels bad to do it. That was happening to me today. Interesting. I've had like moments where, you know, when you get on a call and someone starts talking, you're like, I think I have all the power in this conversation. I, whenever that happens to me, like someone starts talking, their plan just doesn't sound very good. Like I feel like I immediately just switch the gear of the call to where it's like they have to sell me. I don't know. This might be just a good tactic, but if they ever start talking about like a really bad plan, I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. So I'm like, I sit back and I listen, I listen, listen. And then I'm like, all right, so that's not going to work. <laughs> um, this is what I've seen work. And now what I do is I'm like, I'm in the driver's seat here. I'm like, I'm going to give them what I think would work and why I don't think their plan works and kind of force them to sell me to see if they could be a good fit for us. Maybe that's just like a, an, like a sales tactic I made up in Uh, my head. Like clients you already have, you know, it's like something goes a little bit off and they're like, let's change everything. Anyway, I had this call today and it was with one of the intangible offers people. So it's not like. I'm going to make an ROI. It's get rid of limited beliefs, you know, tough. self-confidence. Those yeah. are, I find those to be tough. Yeah. Because I find like, they sell better on need. like Instagram. There is a need for them, but I find them to be like tough. But thanks to them, I found the three most powerful words in all of copywriting. So here it is. The three most powerful words in all of copywriting are so you can. So I'll give you an example. This person was all about breaking limited beliefs. And he had like seven things on his landing page. Self-doubt, limited beliefs, get rid of childhood traumas, a bunch of stuff. So I said, okay, what niche are you in? He's like, health. I'm like, wrong. You're in the wealth niche. Because what we're going to do together now is you're going to help people get rid of their limited beliefs so they can make more money, grow their business, increase profits. When you use the words, so you can, and you can see it a lot in my copy, it allows you to show people the boring stuff, but turn it into exciting stuff. So for you, right? You write for people. I will write for you this many posts every day, so you can maximize engagement. If I just say, I'm going to write this many posts for you, it's like, but why not more? Why not less? But if you say, We study this and I know this is the optimum amount. And remember, the goal is so you can maximize engagement. So when I'm encountered with an offer that I don't really know how to phrase, I like to take a step back and think, okay, what are we selling here? Time, money, whatever. And then I will turn whatever they currently do 
add so you can and turn it into something we all want. Money, time, less effort. Yeah, I was just thinking like the, the minute you said intangible, my mind immediately runs to how can I, what's the fastest possible way to draw a parallel to something that is tangible? Time, money, quit your job, travel more, get a, get a raise, get a promotion, get laid. lose depression, get laid. Yeah, like the second, yeah, that's pretty much, I, in, my, in my marketing experience, like it's just so hard to market without a tangible thing like that. So if you sell it intangible, I think all your marketing should be tangible. Whereas if you have a tangible offer, the marketing can often be a little bit more flexible and you can be more intangible. So I think that's, maybe that's the dichotomy is you could, if you're intangible, you have more tangible marketing. And if you're tangible, you have the opportunity for more intangible marketing. Tell me you have an example for this because that sounded really smart. Well, like for example, uh, like you have a very tangible offer, right? Like it's a cash creator, like you quite literally make money with creating. It's like very tangible. It's in the name. It's in the name of the program. So your marketing can be very intangible. You can post you traveling. You posted like today your your tweet was my CRM. And it's just like emails and it's like labels and it's like it's it's supposed to be a funny, simple CRM, right? It's very cool. That's very intangible. Like nobody's like, I'm gonna buy your labeled CRM Gmail strategy, right? But that is the intangible marketing for the extremely tangible offer where it's literally like my program will make you money. So I think that's like an example or for example, um, storytelling, more lifestyle storytelling where it's like I took my grandma to, um, was it Venice? Venice. I took my grandma to Venice, like very intangible. Yes, I understand that the reader might want to take their grandma to Venice. But that's not drawing the parallel. The parallel is more so I will make you money. So since you have a very make money offer, I think your marketing can be more intangible. Whereas, for example, if you have an intangible offer, like what was the, uh, what's an offer example of an, like an intangible? Let's talk about, I don't want to say life coaching, but maybe somebody who helps people get rid of their limiting beliefs. So like somebody who helps getting rid, rid of their limiting beliefs, like it's very difficult to market that without drawing the tangible line to get rid of your limiting beast, ask, basically like asking for the promotion, imposter syndrome at your job, uh, imposter syndrome when talking to girls, stuff like that, like limiting beliefs where it's going to the tangible marketing. Like what's an intangible way to do limiting beliefs, right? It's like I had a limiting belief that I couldn't fly somewhere. Like I had a limiting belief that I couldn't go and travel to this place. It's not really good marketing. It doesn't really sound right. Even saying it, I'm like, Ugh, like, no, it doesn't work. So I think that's where it's like... You, I think you need both. You need you need the tangible somewhere, whether it's in the marketing or in the offer. I think if you do both tangible and tangible, it's good. But I think you do ultimately want some intangible because you want to be a realistic person, not just like the straight money, 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 money. And that's when people start to not believe you as much. Nice. I like it. Yeah. I used to stay away from these intangibles until I, and I learned this in Miami with you. There was this spirituality woman selling like thirty thousand dollar a year packages is the number right? Like thirty, like no, 70. it was like a hundred thousand. Uh, yeah, some, it's like seventy, like hundred twenty. Yeah, it goes up. Yeah, it's like crazy, and like yeah, that's how you break your limiting beliefs. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, so it's like you know, like these companies, like they sell people who sell to big companies, they have like not so much tangible offers. Is we're gonna revolutionize the way you do management. Like, uh, we're gonna gonna supercharge the communication in your team to in increase cohesion and synthesizing and shit it's like at what point do you get to that level that you can say stupid stuff and big companies are like i need that yeah well like that person for example like their tangible their marketing is very tangible i made seven figures this year i made 100k from one client i did this and then their actual offer is so intangible it's like i'm gonna help you build <laughs> drop your limiting beliefs Believe in yourself, manifest it. An like, activation call. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? We're gonna have an activation call. Exactly. So that's a great that's a great example. All right. Is there anything new with X that you've seen? I've seen some people like Joe Rogan, I thought he was gonna post his stuff oh, on X. Was that yeah, a thing? So, so he just signed the deal. I think it was like was it yesterday or the day before? Uh basically he re signed with Spotify, but he dropped the exclusivity. I think the exclusivity is that he doesn't post on, probably just doesn't post on Apple. <laughs> That's basically, they basically paid him another hundreds of millions of dollar contract to not post on Apple Podcasts. 
Um, so he signed, he resigned with Spotify, but the nuance now is that he added new things into the deal where he can post now on YouTube X and I believe Amazon. So that was, that's obviously huge is the fact that he wants to go and support X as the social media platform of choice for his podcast. Joe Rogan is coming back to YouTube. He's, he's already on YouTube for clips, but I believe he's coming back for full length as well. Fuck yeah. Dude, I love the <laughs> Rogan podcast, but I just don't like looking at it on Spotify. That's the worst part about it. The video yeah. features on Spotify suck. They're like, yeah, it's all right. But what I don't like about it is that I can't filter by the most viewed or most popular. And I like to do that. I can only see my latest. I, I can't see the thumbnail. It's like not my thing. I don't think I've ever listened to a podcast to completion on X. Um, but I do think it's very cool, especially with, um, the timestamp feature. So I think that's what makes it really good is that you could just click through the timestamps super easy on your phone. It's probably the easiest platform for timestamps because even YouTube, you have to kind of open the description to get to the timestamps or you kind of have to scroll. Whereas on Twitter, it's like just your fingers, like do, 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 You could kind of just click the timestamp. So that's going to be sick. Uh, he's definitely joining that, uh, free speech revolution. There you go. Bro, I have a question. And it's a self-serving question. You said that my post today was talking about my CRM. That was not a post. That was an email. Are you back on my email list? Was it an email? It was an email. I am on your email list. I support you. No, bullshit. You don't read my emails. You told me that. that funny enough is I, I, have, so I have a third email. Do you have a third email where you subscribe to stuff? Another email? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for swipe files? So I created a new email... Um, I used to use it for subscribing to newsletters and then I was like, I hate newsletters. So what I did now is I actually use it now. I subscribe to only people who do direct response and I'm like, ah, now I think I've figured out how I'm actually going to read stuff. And I still don't read most. I read like probably like one in 10. Uh, but this one, the subject line got me was this, this was it like the $78,000 CRM? My $74,000 CRM. So that, so like, I still don't open 90%, but that one got me. And I subscribed to uh, you. There's this big copywriter that everyone subscribes to. I forget what his name is. Subscribe to him. And I, I subscribe to the big guys, Dan Kennedy, Russell Brunson, et cetera. Uh, but now I actually use it. So I think what I figured out is I just hate newsletters. <laughs> <laughs> we it's talked not, about this. It's not emails. It's newsletters. I thought it was, the, I thought it was the platform, but it was just the medium. What do you what do you mean? You just hate what do you hate and what do you not hate? I don't get it. I think newsletters are too structured. They remind me of a blog a little bit. They don't get to the point. Like, have you ever opened like a oh, contrarian you mean like thinking? The weekly, like yes, weekly Wednesdays. You, op you, op like you, op you open it and it's like, in this newsletter, we're gonna talk about this, this, and this. And then it's structure. I'm like, dude, get to the point. Uh, I just can't read them. But I like with direct response and what I've noticed with all of the people I subscribe to, it's literally just like, hey value <laughs> and then it's like <laughs> and then at the end it's like bye <laughs> i'm just like this is awesome um so now i actually i've actually figured out that i'm i'm interested in it i don't do it still but um it actually gives me more creative juices wonderful i we're you're converting to the to the true religion like here's something we, that happened i watched the jeff bezos podcast and he said i try to think about things that won't change instead of things that will and i'm like what won't change my answer was newsletters. They're going to stay. And I asked you, what do you think, Marcos? And you're like, yeah, newsletters, they're going to die. <laughs> like completely <laughs> opposite. <laughs> like completely opposite things. And I'm just like, no, nah, you're tripping. Like there, there's no way. Like an argument for that was like, it's just not working for, for me, right? And I'm like, it, it arrived to an insight, which was if you don't enjoy creating it, you won't profit from it. You know what? One part of why I think I consider I made it is that I don't need to pull up my phone and record a talking head video ever again in my life in order to put foot on the table. I find immense joy in knowing that I don't need to say, hey, hey, wait, before you scroll, here are 10 tips to shoot me, bro. Fuck that. I don't do that. And I love it because... I don't like creating that. Therefore, I'm not going to profit from it because my resistance is going to bleed into the reader or the consumer. So when people ask me what's the best platform, the answer is actually any platform you actually enjoy. 
And then if you get good at it, that's going to be enough for you to sustain a really good income. And then you can cross promote. Now my cross promotion strategy goes as follow. It's comment C, comment V. I'll create an email and I'll send it on, let's say this $74,000 CRM email that you saw today. It comes out today as an email. Tomorrow, it'll come out as a post on Instagram or LinkedIn or anywhere. Like I just create for email because that's the pl platform I enjoy the most. And I copy and paste into the rest, but I like to put email first and social second. And that's the entire content strategy is copy and pasting. Are you sure it wasn't on Twitter? I really don't read emails. I'm sure, bro. I'm sure. Now, don't, don't back out on me or at least do it outside the podcast. Let it be known in the record that Marcos reads my emails. Everybody should, proud of, should know you this. Should feel, you should feel proud of yourself for getting me to read an email. Yeah, you know what? I, 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 let me just put it on my bio real quick before we continue. Let's just pause the entire thing. I'll put it right now. On today's episode of the Change Your Mind podcast, I think I've realized that it's not that I think email's dead. I think newsletters will die, but I think email probably still got like a few decades left before we get something new. And if I had to guess, it'll probably something, it'll be something to do with like the blockchain or like mixed with like the Apple Vision Pro. You're going to get like Neuralink notifications and it's going to feel like a shock on your head and you're going to, it's going to pop up in front of you. That's like probably the next evolution of that. But I think email in our lifetime is probably around to stay. But I do think newsletters, newsletters, when I say newsletters are like, you know what I mean? Uh, the hustle. Yeah. Let, I think we should, the distinction here is the frequency at which they come out. Yeah. Like the, the milky weekly, road. Monthly yeah. versus we're talking like I do daily. You're talking about weekly, monthly structure stuff. Yeah. I think ultimately it probably, they probably won't die. You're right. It's probably just people who consume newsletters probably also like creating them. Whereas I like creating, I mean, I like consuming tweets because I create tweets and vice versa. Uh, something I'm actually doing with this, and maybe this is how you can not be naive like me. If you want to not be naive like me, I'm on season three. So I actually divided my YouTube channel into seasons. And it's because I was like the first kind of content I made in 2018, 19, maybe it was like 20, whatever. I had a podcast and I was like, uh, I hate this. I did nine episodes and I was like, I'm done. Season two of YouTube was, season two is really two parts, but season two A was doing when I had the AI profile picture. This is OG me when I joined your groups. These were like talking loom videos, basically just recordings. And it was just all tutorials for Twitter. And then season two A was heavily edited. What you see across everyone doing is like the heavily edited sitting down like this talking. And I also hated those two. So now I'm on season three and I start tomorrow. And season three is me on my love sack, drawing stuff and talking and just super raw, no script whatsoever. I'm just going to go on tangents for 10 minutes at a time. And I've already got four scheduled and I might like them. I might hate them. But I think the most important thing with YouTube is to not quit making videos, but maybe change the style of videos. Because I think that's what I've seen most people do is they like hate what they're doing, but they don't necessarily hate the medium. So maybe that's the same. I think that's probably the lesson I'm taking from this email fiasco is that I hate reading newsletters, but it doesn't mean email sucks and it doesn't mean I should not do email. It just means I should maybe do a different kind of email at a different frequency. So I think that's probably where I'll go. I did a launch sequence yesterday. I thought that was pretty cool. Like an email? I did an email launch sequence. Yeah, I was like pretty chill. I just used a template that my friend gave me. <laughs> I was like, this is easy. I still am not, ha I don't have the habit to do it from scratch like you yet. But uh, yeah, that's my that's my YouTube thing. You already do. You're just not turning it on. Like you're already posting every day. You're writing so much every day. Like yeah. an email is three tweets sewn together. That's all an email is. And a call to action to reply. That's it. Like you're just having like kind of, kind of turn like that kind of brain on, you know, like the moment like you, a lot of it is just giving yourself permission. And it's like, okay, now I'm going to write three tweets together, like a longer form tweet. And that's it. Like you're already good at this. You just don't know it. Yeah. Yet. Here's my, here's my podcast exclusive. I'm not going to expand too much, but I started writing a book. So I've basically, cr I'm creating a daily writing habit where I write in a book. I write the book and it's, uh, it is pretty crazy. It's crazy how many words you can put on a piece of paper when you like commit to a longer form piece of writing. So uh, that's on today's episode. That's the exclusive. It'll come out in like three years. <laughs> it's it's going to be pretty cool. Wonderful. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, welcome sequences. I like that. I don't believe in welcome sequences. I don't believe in lead nurturing. So 
I posted this yesterday, and I think this is a, a belief that really changed how I think about money. So I don't believe in metrics I can't measure. I believe in making offers and finding out if people want them or not. Doesn't sell, tweet. Sells, do more. Brand awareness, lead nurturing, building trust. These don't matter to me because I'm not Coca-Cola. So I think that a lot of us are based where like a lot of content creators make their decisions based on feel rather than facts. So it's like, I'm definitely building trust, which tells me that people are going to buy. I'm building in public and people are telling me they like it, which tells me that I'm building goodwill. When you use those words and when you cash yourself, which tells me or like you're measuring intangibles, to me, it's like you're not, you're nothing is written. Like when people are like, how do I know if my offer is good? Well, you make it. And then if you send it to people and people don't like it, then that's it. So this is why I started doing daily emails and I stopped trying to nurture people because, and this is like a huge insight I arrived to and I'd love to hear your take on it. The more of your free content people consume, the less likely they are to become paid clients because they're like, oh, I know Marcos. I've consumed his content for two years. Like I don't really, really need to join his stuff because I already know his stuff. I've read it for so long. And I've noticed that my best clients didn't know who I was two weeks ago. Somebody told them about it. I popped it in their feed. And because I made a daily offer and I went against common lead nurturing practices, they bought the offer and then they bought the next offer and then they bought the next offer. So this is why I think lead nurturing is a myth. I don't believe in lead nurturing because people's pain doesn't grow, it shrinks. The moment they see your stuff and they opt into your funnel, that is the moment at which the pain is highest. Pain just gets lower then, and then they stop reading your lists. You don't read my emails, but there was a point at which you did. At some point, your pain shrank. And you're like, ah, whatever, right? Like, fuck I liked guy. reading <laughs> the emails when I was in them. Yeah, there you go. Well, <laughs> yeah, there you go. So people's pain doesn't grow, it shrinks. And that's why I don't believe in literature. Make them an offer and make it to them fast. My first email literally says, I'm going to send you a daily email and I'm going to make you an offer every day so that you can grow your business. If you don't like it, you can leave. And I get like 12 to 15 unsubscribers on every email I send, which to some people is disastrous, but that's because that's only what you see on the surface. What you see beneath the surface is a business that averaged nine clients per week on January because I made an offer every day and I got good at nurturing. I got good at making offers and not nurturing people into offers. Well, how many subscribers do you think you're getting per day? I can tell you. I'm guessing it's at least 12 to 15. So for the past seven days, it has been 124 subscribers. So like 17, 18 per day. So you're averaging a net gain of five to six new subscribers a day. With 220,000 followers. So this is a really good point. And I want to come back to what you asked for on my take because I do have a take put on this. This is some like really high value stuff. I, I explain this to clients. I explain this to prospects. I think your goal with kind of building your social media, building your business, et cetera, should always be to create a, basically create a self-liquidating funnel with content. So it's like if you can make if you can essentially, let's say you're investing X amount, and this is how I do it with my clients, right? It's like they invest X amount of dollars with me. If I can make you the minimum that much money and you are also gaining followers, you have net free new followers every month for the rest of your life. Do you see how that's such a no-brainer? Now do that with emails, right? If you're gaining six net emails a day and you're making money on top of that, your business will literally last forever. Like literally, you don't even have to worry until you have too many unsubscribers or not enough new subscribers to sustain your model. Do you see how that's like, how great that is? It's, it's so underrated. It's like your business is freaking sick. It's like, if you can do that, your business is untouchable. Your whole goal should just be to create that funnel and keep it and build the moat around it so that it can't be affected. And it, that, that number keeps growing. So you can go from net six, net seven, net 12, net a hundred, right? Same with the money. It's like, if I can make you 5K this month and 5K next month and 5K the month after that, and then it make you 10, 20, 30, you're also gaining followers on top of that. And you're building that lead pool over and over and over. And that follower base can then grow to other platforms. It's so exponential. So 
I think the core lesson, especially for both of us who build social media businesses for a living, is if you can create a funnel like that, that's just always net gain every day, it's un you're unstoppable. Yeah. Plus, you're making an offer every day. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. That's funny. I actually, I have a story about that. I made an offer to a guy eight months ago, maybe, or it was last year for sure. He DMs me earlier this week and he goes, hey, about that offer you made to me last year. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm interested. <laughs> like that. Now imagine I make an offer every day and I don't. I make an offer like <laughs> once a week. Never. <laughs> I'm so bad at making offers. Uh, it's just, we're, we're so capped, I swear. I made an offer last year and he comes to me this week and he's like, yeah, about that offer you make last year. So what do you think happens if you make an offer every day? Every day, how much that compounds. You're basically putting yourself into their life, or into their life and into the view. And you're basically like, hey, I'm here. And you do that every day. How much compound interest will you make? 365 days, two years, three years, 10 years. Nuts. And then it to the people that give me the counter on me into that. But I'm trying to build goodwill. I don't want to, I want to want to piece up my audience and break, break their trust. Because the bigger the runway, the bigger the plane that can take off. I think that's kind of how it goes. Kind of. Like that business model works if you sell to the 1% of the 1%. You're a real estate syndicate. Your private equity, it works, right? But the people who tell you that's the business model that works, they don't sell $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 client packages. You and I, we need to sell different things. We need to play different games. We can't do that. I'm going to do something so bad. All right, I'm going to read you an excerpt from the book I'm writing because <laughs> it's so relevant. I just have to. I'll never do this again, but it's so relevant to what you just said. It's like... And, oh, it's so helpful. Okay, I'm not going to, I'll skip that. So who is this, who is JK's advice not for? I got you. Who is JK's advice not for? The artist, the talented creator, the celebrity who is so talented at building content and at building a successful personal brand that they want to build goodwill and they kind of just want to build a massive audience. That's the Mr. Beasts of the world, the Logan Pauls of the world, et cetera, right? JK's not here for you. It's 1% of you. It's 0.1% of you. Who are you here for? The aspiring entrepreneur, the average Joe, the introvert, the college grad, the ambitious teenager, anyone who understands the value of being a creator, but doesn't consider themselves in that 0.1%. And you actually have to create that self-liquidating funnel that we just spoke about to sustain this endeavor. You're not going to be sitting here creating for a year. Where are you going to live? Where are you going to eat? You need money to sustain this project. And who was it that said it? Was it, uh, I forget who said it, but it was, maybe it was Nick Huber. Um, any business that isn't profiting in two months is a failure. <laughs> failure. And I paraphrase that, that caption, but it really, it really applies here. It's like, there's two completely different types of people and it's not this or that. It's, there's nuance involved. It's, this is for this person, this rare person, and then this is for this person. Yeah. You want to go make Mr. Beast videos? Sure. Good luck. Go. You know what I mean? We're here for the person who wants to make money within two months so they can actually sustain a life. Done. It's like you're friend, friend zoning yourself. You know, you're get, you're making all these favors to the girl. You're treating her nicely. And you're like, but Marcos, I promise to you, bro. I'm setting up all this goodwill. I'm giving her so much. When I finally ask her out, she's definitely going to say yes in a year. Well, have you tried just asking her out? What do you think might happen? Like some people just don't want to wait. You know, it's like some people just want the thing. It's kind of like the person who thinks like there's there's the fairy tale person and there's the practical person. The person is like you you should well, everyone's met this kind of person where they're like I want to meet my I want to meet my soulmate in the wild. I just want it to come to me. Like my soulmate's going to I know they're out there. They're going to come to me, etc. And then you have the person who's practical and is like, "No, if I go on more dates, I'll probably have more chances to find my soulmate." to two kinds of people <laughs> and yes there are stories of the person who finds their soulmate out there and then there's the people who actively take they take their life into their hands and they don't wait for life to happen to them and they, they happen to life yeah the the what the wilderness person assume that's not you just assume yeah, that's not you that's the problem is yeah i had a friend in college bro ugly fat like fucked up teeth you know short he used to go, man, like we used to go clubbing and every time he would just get a girl, take her home. And like, 
you know, we look at the guy and we're like, the results don't correlate with, you know, the person. So it's like, bro, what are you doing that we're not? He just said it so succinctly, so simple. He said, well, it's very simple, bro. When a girl says no, I just go on to the next. And if she says no, I just go on to the next because somebody is going to say yes. And I don't talk to him much, but that shit was enlightening. That guy was the enlightened person. He just knew what to do. Just say, just make more offers. Like, I don't, I don't think people need to overcomplicate it. And I think that when people are like, let me like work for free first. Let me get some testimonials first. I think that's cool for not wanting or not having the courage to be able to be told no. I think it's also just a luxury. It's like, I know someone is doing that, for example, and he has that luxury because he's already been successful. It's like, yes, if you've already been successful, you already have money, you had a successful exit, like you have the luxury to kind of take your time with things. But if you are from zero, man, which is 99% of people, you got to be gritty. You have to be so gritty if you actually want it. Like, you know, there's going to be more and more competition every single day. Like, If you don't have the grit, you're done. I actually have a tweet that goes well with this. So the tweet was uh, Presley. He's like the clip curator. They do like YouTube video. It's like an agency. Anyway. He was like, used to think I was being modest by not posting, but I was really just too scared to sell my services. And I'm looking to change that this year. Application and bio if you'd like to work with us. And I, uh, I commented, I'm like, this is the big gear shift. It's like unapologetic selling because you know your shit works. That's necessary if you want to hit the new level. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I have another tweet that goes well with it. I, I, sent it. I sent it right here. Bad marketing outcomes often come from a lack of confidence. The guru doesn't believe in himself and that insecurity bleeds into the marketing. People don't believe him because he doesn't even believe in himself. That's a big one. That is like why I have to, that's basically why I have to vet who we work with. It's like, since, you know, if we're writing for someone, if we don't have conviction, the content definitely is not going to have conviction. You know what I mean? It's like, if I don't believe you, I'm like, this this is why I would never work with an OnlyFans agency. I'm not going to have conviction in the writing. I'm going to be like kind of tippy toeing and being like, mm, you could do this. It's it's a little unethical. You know what I mean? But if I have conviction about the offer, you know, I'm writing for JK. And I'm like, look at all my testimonials. I do this every day. I don't have a CRM. Like I can have conviction because I know it works and I know the success that you can provide. You know what I mean? So it's the same way for me. And that's probably the same thing if anyone hires a content team. You know what I mean? It's like if any content person is like, you can't write content for something you don't believe in. And it serves to be, put it in a touchable place, put it in a tangible place. What's the outcome you can help people do? Step one. Step two, you write down what are all the steps to get to that outcome. But a lot of people just don't have that. You know, they read an offer book and they have one offer and they're like, this is what I do. But if you ask them, how do you accomplish it? Like, can you split it in terms of three and explain to me why every step matter and what is the checkpoint in each step? A lot of people just can't. And I couldn't. And because I was unclear in my own process, I was ineffective in my sales process. People didn't know what I was selling because I didn't fucking know what I was selling. And it was clear on a call. One guy asked somebody else. It wasn't to me, thank God. But somebody asked another person on a call and I was listening. He said, okay, bro, why should people choose you over somebody else? And I was looking at myself and thinking, Fuck, I don't know the answer to that question. This is a huge issue because if I cannot tell you why I am better than the rest or why I'm different than the rest, how is my customer or my prospect supposed to know? Confidence in your marketing comes from belief in like your own process and your own product. The moment I get confident knowing that my stuff works, I started selling more simply because people could feel that I could believe in what I was putting out there. Yeah. And whether you're doing sales calls, DMs, podcasts, like you can feel the conviction through every medium, emails, content. It's like when you have conviction, it, it's an, it's the energy, bro. <laughs> it's the energy, bro. Have you ever been on a sales call with someone you could just tell they're full of shit? Yeah. It's everyone has, you, you just tell when someone's full of shit and like, it's kind of like the body. It reminds me of, um, if you've ever seen those detective security cams of like the interrogation rooms, and they go over the body language of the suspect and like the suspect who's innocent is always much more open and the suspect who's guilty is like, is always like this and talking really fast and you can tell they're guilty. Same thing with sales, bro. Like me, I'm not a salesperson, but on my sales calls, I'm very confident what we have and I'm also, I'm also at capacities half the time. So I'm just like, 
I'm like, most of the time it's very much just a conversation and like, are they a good fit, et cetera. Yeah. Content creators ask themselves, how do I convince this guy? Cash creators ask themselves, do I want this guy? Can he convince me? You know what I mean? Also that helps when you go, when you have like a really dialed in ICP, like when you really dial in on who, on who you want to work with and who, not even who you want to work with, who your stuff is most successful for. I did this exercise, I think it was, I forget where the exercise came from, but it was basically breaking down every piece of the demographic of my ideal client, how many kids they have, what gender they are, where they're from, what languages they speak, who they are, literally everything. And you could cater your marketing to that. And I was like, what is the percentage of people that, for example, who follows me that fit this demographic? I know if you have Instagram, you could probably just see, but on Twitter, you don't have demographics. So you probably just have to think, but it's probably like 1%, 0.1%, 0.01%. So it's like, realistically, people should have to sell themselves to work with you. You know what I mean? It's like, you shouldn't accept anyone anyway. That's kind of the Harvard model. What makes this easy and like practical, because like maybe somebody's listening and they're like, yeah, people should choose me, but I also like don't get many leads. So like, what do I do? Right. But search for this really well. It's just capping your spots and aim low. Like I had a 220,000 follower audience when I first started doing this no sales calls thing. And I said, I'm going to aim for eight. I'm going to cap my spots at eight this month. It was aiming low. Realistically, I could have done more, but failing and like finding a small cap you can stick to. And if you're at zero, it's one. And if, you know, you just find a small cap you can stick to and you fill it or like you're close to filling it, it allows you to change the way you speak to the market. So let's say you only take two clients right? You say, I'm only taking two clients because I only have capacity for two. The guy that says, I only have capacity for two is going to sell more than the guy that doesn't include capacity in his sales messaging because the other one has implicit highest status. And let's say one is taken, then you can use the wording, half the spots are taken. You can use the wording, I only have one more spot left. It gets even better when you set up a date at which you close. I find it really important as coaches, consultants, service providers, to be and arrive at a point at which some people are not able to give you money. Because then they're going to be like, who is this Marcos guy? And who does he think he is that he won't take my money? It implies higher status. So that when you open again, or when you have more spots, even though you ain't low, you'll approach the conversation from a higher status than if you didn't otherwise. I also, it's like, remember when you told me people just want dopamine? I think in this situation, it's like, you just need leverage, bro. Like, uh, one way to, uh, an additional thing you can add to that, and I think you should have both. If your ICP is so dialed in, it should be dialed in enough to where you don't really have much competition. Like for you, it's like, okay, coaches, consultants, server providers, very broad. Many people serve them. I serve them. Okay, how do you dial in more than that? Well, now you're so dialed in that you, I don't think you have any competitors with your product, right? You have, we don't do sales calls. We're heavy on the email list. We make an offer every day. I don't have a CRM. Like, I, I personally don't know anyone else in the market that has that offer. Do you see how your ICP might be brought, but your offer is so specific that you're actually going to attract a very, a very specific sub, sub segment of that ICP who may not want to do certain things and actually want your business model. So now you're basically just so unique that you have all the leverage to now apply that scarcity. Same thing with me. It's like, can you name one person that serves our ICP specifically for Twitter ghostwriting? No, yeah, I can't. If I, <laughs> I mean, if the ghostwriters, <laughs> if you're out there, let me know. I'll funnel hack you. It's like who is making more money for coaches and consultants? You know what I mean? It's just like not a thing. It's like my only real competitor that I know of are Legacy Builder and Story Arp. So, for example, let's do a competitor analysis. Legacy Builder, he promises ten thousand followers in ninety days to founder CEOs and agency owners. How much do they charge? Do you know? I don't know, unfortunately. But it's just so different from my offer that I'm like, I don't even need to funnel hack them because it's just not the same thing. You know what I mean? Uh, I would have funnel hacked him if it was the same offer though. So I, there's a there's your lesson as a competitor. It's like I would have funnel hacked him if it was my offer, but it's not, so I don't care. Story Arb. Story Arb is um, Alex Lieberman, co-founder of Morning Brews, ghostwriting agency that he put some wrapping paper on and he called it the Modern Executive's Personal Branding Partner or something like that. They're commoditized. I think their pricing's on their website. It's like, Four grand a month, seven, six grand a month, eight or 10 grand a month. And they have like different packages and they're going for the modern executive, like CEOs, et cetera, C-suite executives. So it's, again, it's like, 
a commoditized or sorry, a productized service that is a targeting high level executives. So my two biggest competitors are just completely different markets than me. So I'm like so unique that I don't really have to compete that much. You know what I mean? I think I think the uniqueness comes comes from like you just being clear on your process. And we we talked about this on the on the podcast, caps locking your stuff. Like don't just call it the funnel, call it like the bird funnel. You know, it's not it's <laughs> It's not the it's not the it's not the process. It's the two hour process. Whatever. I'll give you an example. I was talking about um, a productivity coach earlier this week, and um, productivity coach kind of commoditized. But you can radically change your niche or like the effectiveness you have within your niche just by caps locking your stuff. So what we arrived to was okay, bro. You're not a productivity coach. Let me tell you what you are. You are the two hour man. The two hour man believes in getting. Effective work done, not a lot of work done. The two-hour man believes in the essential, not the urgent. The two-hour man believes in getting the big levers out of the way and delegating the small levers to systems or somebody else who can do them for you. Because as two-hour men, we understand that we don't get paid for the work we produce. We get paid for how well we can think about problems and how well we can solve them. It's productivity offer, bro. It's the same shit. But because you caps lock it, it's IP. It's something completely new. What's cash creators? Cash creators is the URL that was available when I looked for a few names, but because you give it meaning by caps locking it and giving it certain processes, that's what makes the niche of one work. It's not thinking I'm a guy for seven, six and seven figure entrepreneurs. I'm the guy for the agency owners. No, no, no. Like that's way different than that. It's thinking about what makes you, what makes your process unique. You don't choose the niche. The niche chooses you when you set out that process into the wild. I think it, the niche choose you is definitely is definitely correct. Like for me, I just kind of put out my skills to clients and then all the clients that weren't in my current ICP pretty much either failed or didn't retain. And all the clients who are in my ICP were retaining and getting amazing results. And I'm like, okay, that's my ICP. You know what I mean? So like you're a productivity coach and you, you do productivity coaching for four different profiles. And one of them is CEO or CMO, JK Molina. And you're like, wow, this was amazing. Like I got the best case study with him. So it's like, boom, you have your ICP. So simple. The niche definitely finds you. Yeah. The niche finds you. You don't find the niche, the niche finds you. It's always step two. People are like, what niche should I like double down into? It's like, it's like asking like, what, what kind of, what kind of girlfriends, what kind of girl should I be talking to? It's like, yeah, you know, it's like whoever likes you back, you know, and <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah, this. whoever likes you better. What's, what's my type? The one that I can get, right? <laughs> 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 like for me, it was, I answered two, like I answered one practical and one that was more like finds me. It was one, obviously, who do I get the best results for? But another one I asked myself is who can I retain the longest? Who's going to give me the highest LTV? It's like, I know that I can't retain, for example, a software founder for too long because I don't make any money. You get them 10K followers and then what? They can't afford me. You know what I mean? Unless they've set aside a marketing budget in advance, which is, a really cool ICP idea, by the way, if you're a, an agency owner is targeting people that have raised money and they just have money to blow from VCs. But majority of business owners, they're investing money up front, right? They need to make that money back. So for me, I was like, how can I just make people money month over month? So that's how I found my ICP because LTV is, I know you've had this as well, where you're like, who can I retain longer? That's important. Bro, you just described my ideal business if I wasn't doing this thing. Let me tell you what my ideal business is. It's <laughs> this kid from Stanford or Harvard that, you know, they got a bunch of money because they had a nice idea and, you know, their daddy has connections, stuff like that. And they just blow a hundred thousand dollars on a website agency. And then they're out of business in two months and you don't even need to deliver the website. You just skip the a hundred thousand dollars from the website because they went bankrupt. That's my ideal business model. It's servicing the money of private equity companies that spend a shit ton and they're out of business in two months. You get paid, you get a fast yes, you don't even need to deliver the thing. I, one day, one day, I have a dream that is going to be the thing I do. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Maybe someday. Are you on the sparkling water grind? I am always on the sparkling water grind. We just bought like so much sparkling water. I'm a big fan of like sparkling water. I'll, you know, I like Olipops, um, stuff like that. What's Olipops? It's like sparkling. It's like 
tastes like a soda, but it's like a five calorie sparkling water that has flavor in it. It's pretty popular. It's probiotic, helps your gut health. I don't know. I've turned into a white girl. <laughs> kind of. My favorite soda in the U.S. was from Whole Foods. It's one that's creamy and it's creamy, zero calories. I don't know what it's called, but it's the best thing ever. Zero calorie. Look, when can you ever get the creamy flavor or like feeling without without a shit ton of calories? You can't. Like it, that's wonderful about Whole Foods. I always feel like whenever I see a drink like that, I'm like, there's got to be something in here that's gonna kill me. Like, is it? Is there some fake chemical sugar? Or yeah, some bro. Sort of, you like, drink Coke Zero, so yeah. like, just, just get over yourself. Whoa, just whoa, come whoa, on. whoa! Relax, yeah, relax, relax. Dude, come on. Don't expose me like that online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like Solbrum posted this he said the people even consume this uh, processed shit and it was like a bunch of McDonald's and, and smoothies but the same people who say that are like oh shit this has protein and it's a bunch of like whey protein and quest Mars and I'm like damn like that's me like I, I felt that I was just eating one before the show Fuck. did you see did you see Solbrum's face, re face reveal I did what a chat that's the news on Money Twitter these days. <laughs> What's new on Money Twitter? Soul bra face reveal. <laughs> you know what I realized? What? I realized, and I think this is just like a, a sign of the times. I, I've realized every anonymous account has really, has face revealed and realized that personal brand is king. I think anonymous can only go so far. And I I, I saw three now in the last three months that have come out on, uh, from anonymous to personal brand. And that's where I've, I was already convinced, obviously, of that personal brand is king, but now I really believe it. And it was um, it was Sobra, Wiz of Ecom, and who was the, Save Your Sons? He was on your hundred uh, K call. Oh right. Uh, he just came out. He just came out yesterday. So he came out of the closet. I was about to say that. Like Save Your Sons, if you're listening to this, you're so brave, bro. And we're so proud of you, man. But I, I do think I do think it's just I think it's a thing. I think you got to have personal brands attached to things now, especially to kind of there's always a ceiling, I think, with themes and with uh, theme pages or brands. I think there's a, a theme of that. And I think everybody's kind of going the personal brand route. And now with like, look at Hershey's, look at Gatorade. They're always start, they're starting to get smacked up a little bit by Feastables and Prime. They're like, fuck, we need a face of our brand. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, um, yeah I think that's I, th the I think it I think it works. Because having your, I think the reason why personal brands work more than faceless brands, it's because you have more to lose. So if I hire yeah. the Birdhouse Twitter account to help me with my stuff and they scam me, they steal all my money, who am I blaming? A bird? Right. The lamp behind you that doesn't even look like a bird? Like, this is like you're going to die, right? But it's like, if I hire Marcos to do my stuff and he scams me, Marcos is fucked because I'm going to make a huge deal about it. And people know that. That trust factors in on the sale. So because you have your face out there, you have more to lose. But because you have more to lose, you have more accountability. Because you have more accountability, you have more trust. So therefore, yeah. that arrangement works when you have your face out there. I used to be anonymous. Having my face out there, I thought, I mean, why not? I think it's also just like, it's both positive and negative too. I think people like having someone that they can fucking blame if something doesn't go wrong, like, or something goes wrong. They're like, they feel more comfortable giving the money because they can go, like, for example, you go on YouTube, you don't see any Gatorade reviews, like Hershey reviews, but you see all these Prime and Feastables review, like ripping apart the product because they have someone to, they have someone to hit, you know what I mean? They have someone to talk about, someone to blame. It's like, I think there's a bit of a novelty there now with the new social media. It's like people want someone that can A, praise or B, blame or A, get in their cult or B, attack. So it's kind of like, I think it, I agree with that where it's like they have someone there that they A, trust or can then if they get scammed, they're like, they could just destroy you. So they think they won't get scammed. Have you ever heard about this? I think it's the 27 word sentence or like 16 word sentence of no. uh, that convinces people. Hold on, it's uh, people will do anything for those who... It's a good way to like, it's a good reminder of good copywriting. So I'm pretty sure you've seen this. Let me look this up. Oh, there you go. So I think it's 27, 27 words to make the world do your bidding. Words to make the world do your bidding. And this is something that's good to read if you're like struggling to write copy and you want to kind of get into the right state of mind. This is uh, a quick hack. So Blair Warren says, 
People will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, and help them throw rocks at their enemies. Sometimes when I'm kind of having this rut and I'm like, I can't write very well, I would read this sentence and pick. Am I helping people encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, and help them throw rocks at their enemies? And often it results in a better campaign than if I didn't read it. Because I realized one thing, and it's a lot of our job as, you know, people who create content on the internet, is uh, relieving anxiety. Like people just want to follow us because they're anxious all the time. And if you can relieve a little bit of anxiety by encouraging their dreams, justifying failures, allaying their fears, confirming suspicions, or help them throw rocks at their enemies, they will like you. And they will be interested in the next stage of the funnel. So a lot, of, a lot of it is emotional. This is a big, a big insight, by the way. Like, um, I think about this a lot. It's maybe all I need to do with content is not persuade anyone. Maybe I just need to relieve their anxiety. And so far, it's been working great. I, we got 37 clients in January, averaged like nine clients per week, going strong. And it has come from a lot of this, from helping people relieve their anxiety by doing any of these five. Hell yeah. That's awesome. I, uh, speaking of anxiety, my tweet today was, <laughs> you're like relieving their anxiety. I'm just yelling at them. My tweet was, you don't have anxiety. You're just addicted. <laughs> you're just addicted to caffeine and TikTok. <laughs> I'm like, I genuinely believe <laughs> quit, quit caffeine for one day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I deleted TikTok and cut back on caffeine and now my life is amazing. You guys should try it. Is it? Oh, Maybe yeah. Maybe like an actual improvement? Oh, my productivity is at least up by like 20%. Like in terms of like just being able to power through tasks, I'm like I feel much better. And I also feel that my time needed between tasks is much smaller where I can chain react them better. Whereas before it was like one thing done, must acquire more caffeine for next thing. <laughs> must acquire dopamine to keep yeah. the motivation going. Must acquire caffeine and scroll TikTok to reset. <laughs> By the way, that that's what kills you. It's not tasks, it's the time in between tasks. It's how often you can jump from one item on the to-do list to the next one. Like those five minutes turn into like an hour. That is what kills you. Yeah, I mean, think about how much you could get done if you could just do twice, two things a day instead of one or three things a day instead of one. You know what I mean? Or twice as much a day. You double the speed at which you grow. It's like very, it seems so basic, but you don't think about it until you would put it into action. Yeah. It's one of those platitudes. Somebody in two years is going to say, you know, guys, that thing you said at minute 55 in podcast 33, I felt that. I have a dream. This is going to happen. My future ghostwriter, if you're watching this, transcribe that into a platitude, bro. <laughs> Turn that into a platitude, please. Oh, there you go. That's the pod, boys. All right. Cheers. See you in the next one. <laughs>